Um, okay, so before I introduce Jorge Galicia, we are going to show a video uh, that relates to his topic of discussion, which of course is the dangers of socialism. I, I will go ahead and tell you a little bit about Jorge because when this video is over, I do want him to just immediately come up and, and take the stage. But Jorge is a brave guy. Uh, you know, he had a life just like all of us in Venezuela. Uh, you know, he, it, it's like a, a typical middle class American, the way he was living in Venezuela, Christian, lawyer, now freedom fighter. Uh, before socialism devastated Venezuela, he, he was living life much like each of us. So he's now one of four million Venezuelans who have fled their country following the economic, social, and political collapse that we've unfortunately witnessed. And I want to thank the Fund for American Studies. They have been sponsoring Jorge to speak on college campuses all over the country. As you know, that's a big part of what Steamboat Institute does. And they sponsored his appearance here today, which we truly appreciate. Jorge is going to talk to you about how this could happen to America if we are not vigilant. And on the topic of socialism, I would like to tell you um, about this 10 minute video we are about to show that you are going to love. Last fall, we did a socialism capitalism debate tour as part of our campus liberty tour, visiting several campuses. Um, we went to University of Texas in Austin, University of Maryland. Uh, we were at CU in Denver. And we started with it, we had the debut of this great video that's called The March of History Marx versus Mises. It's produced by Emergent Order and John Papala, based in Austin, Texas. Enjoy. Just do it now! Just do it you see? Now! It's a Just revolution. Capitalism's yeah. days are numbered. Then there goes our freedom. If socialism wins, America loses. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And our civilization. Learn some history. Private property and free markets built modern day society. Yeah, and modern society is the problem. Two for March of History. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy the show, boys. Look at this theater. Look at all of this plenty. This is capitalism. So capitalism's diabetes? Shh. Got it. All right. Your whole world is coming apart. <laughs> I pity you. America is once again at ideological war. After decades of post-war consensus, the great debate between capitalism and socialism has captured the public square. And no two men have more fervently fought this battle than philosopher and journalist Karl Marx, classical liberal economist Ludwig von Mises. Marx versus Mises. Mises versus Marx. The march of history continues. Workers of the world! It's time for the ruling classes to tremble. I'm the people's hero, the MVP, M-A-R-X. Yeah, you know me. Let's go back to when men were free. We hunted and gathered communally, but get ready. Cause here comes the twist A villain appears called a capitalist He puts the proletariat That's us, us. In chains Exploits our labor In pockets of gains Through slick ads He tricks lads and ladies in kind Selling fake needs He poisons our hearts and minds He rots our soul through alienation Pursuing limitless accumulation He works us into an early grave Through debt steals back The money we save Greed is the gospel Profit? The rich get richer through graft and fraud The poor get poorer, but you don't care Doesn't that sound lazy unfair? 200 years I've been singing this song Now my chorus is 99% strong The revolution's here, it's time to repent Your moment is over, your capital spent This is history's lesson You think he's right? Guess he All we want is progression Without bourgeois oppression so we look for the truth as we tighten our boots. 
Who's right, who's wrong? Left, right, left, now the march is on. Guten Tag, Marx. Nice to meet you. My name's Ludwig. Call me teacher. The master of markets. The Austrian boss. You don't like profits? Well, let's talk loss. loss. The problem with your plan is nobody wins except Stalin, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, Lenin, Mugabe. Remember Berlin? They built a wall to keep their people in. Your theories have a rotten foundation. Built on control, not cooperation. Centralized power completely corrupts. Real people suffer. Violence erupts. Your system depends on the very same people you decry as greedy, bourgeois, and evil. If we're not fit to run our own lives, why would you expect our votes to be wise? If you really want to help people rise up, unleash the free market, lift their lives up. It was capitalism, not a socialist plan. Saved billions in India, China, Japan. Everyone has a unique purpose plan. No one solution can serve the whole land. Each individual has their own voice. The heart of my theory is freedom, freedom. and choice. Joy. Joy. This is history's lesson. The market's a blessing. Let's pursue our expression. Living free from aggression. So we look for the truth. As we tighten the boots. Who's right, who's wrong? Left, right, left, now the march is on. Free marketeers love to play this game. Mao kills millions, Marx gets blamed. It's deceptive, dishonest, plain unfair. Did I drive the tanks at Tiananmen Square? Man, I'm a humanist. You can check my receipts, but you gotta break eggs if you wanna eat. Don't like violence? Admit defeat. Then I'll call this revolution complete. complete. Till then, let's get a few things straight. I'm not shaping the future, I'm embracing our fate. My utopian forebears weren't that specific, but this analysis is highly scientific. Scientific. Every social system has governing laws. Capitalism? Doom because the system generated its own fatal flaws by uniting workers in a common cause. Thanks to you, we have all the wealth we need to seize control and eradicate greed. The people are rejecting your bourgeois lies. Real Marxism has never been tried. Equality is the core of my creed. From this one's ability to that one's need. Our healthcare, finance, and industry. Let's collectivize. It set us free. free! Your standard refrain, oh, that's not the real thing. The most common verse all your followers sing. The closer we get to your ideal system, further we go down the road to surf the, the empirical record can't be denied. Your ideas don't work, but they just won't die. Attention! This is not breaking news. Jevons and Manger lit that fuse. Now here comes the bomb via Von Bon Bavirk. He blew up your system, exposed the cork work. The heart of your theory is exploitation of surplus value. That's a bogus equation. You can't explain value by measuring the cost of labor. That theory of value is lost favor. Value is subjective by every measure. One man's trash is another man's treasure. There's no ex Exploitation if two people arrange voluntary exchange, man, that's not deranged. That bourgeois transaction you diss with a scoff creates benefit for both, so we're both better off. Here's the real problem, the crucial equation. Without private markets, there's no calculation to coordinate courses, allocate resources, incentivize choices because it lacks prices. What crops should I grow? Where should this factory go? Should I pick a J.O.? How would your planners ever know? Your theory is a bundle of confusion. Socialism got crushed by the marginal revolution. This is history's lesson. All we want is progression. Let's pursue our expression. Living free from aggression. So we look for the truth. As we tighten our boots. Who's right, who's wrong? Left, right, left, now the march is on. We're all better off? Are you kidding me, Mises? My immiseration thesis tears you to pieces. Your economy grows, but not our wages. You call that progress? I think it's outrageous. In 1820, everyone was poor. Until capitalism kicked down the door. Real wage growth, not stagnation, saved 80% of the world from starvation. You kicked down the door, but you locked us out. That's what your free market is all about. Here's what you do. On your next shopping spree, pick up this book by my boy. Tommy P. The pie can get bigger. It's not zero sum. Free markets have lifted the lowest incomes. If you really want to help out the poorest nations, encourage peace, trade, and immigration. The earth is boiling, and your solution is more production, more pollution, more cheap trinkets and bigger malls, more fossil fuels, more aerosol. Wait, what? For a problem this big, we need total control. A Green New Deal to save the North Pole. We can't 
Mike Campbell, the future on anarchy? Greed's not a plan, it's insanity! Your story's bombastic, your rhetoric's strong. There's only one problem, your theory's wrong! The wealthiest countries do the most to conserve. Have a habit you heard of the Kuznets curve? Only wealthy societies can afford to go green. If you want a better world, see the unseen. Even carbon will bend to creative destruction with entrepreneurship in the means of production. This is history's lesson. It's a blessing. All we want is progression. Living free from aggression. So we look for the truth. As we tighten our boots. Who's right, who's wrong? Left, right, left, now the march is on. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. The long march of history will come to an end. Hegel was close, but too a priori. Watch me break down my dialectical story. Proletariat, bourgeoisie, them versus us, you versus me. Slave, master, lord and serf. New class battles, same old turf. We have what we need to throw the chains off us. Organize the economy like the post off us. The state takes over, but that's not the whole plan. Watch it wither away and leave socialist man. Our goal is true fairness, outcomes that are equal. Capitalism over. Here's a socialist sequel. Revolution's coming. Prepare. For for the fight, workers of the world, you, 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 unite! Nothing is determined. You're so fatalistic, a grand theory of history? Be realistic. You fail predictions? A distraction. Here's some questions that guide human action. Where are we going? What's the right course? What will motivate us? Incentives or force? Here's what you miss from commanding heights. Each person's gifts and individual rights. Across every continent, culture, and creed, people have flourished only when free to find passion, profit, charity, and love through the shake of a hand, not a boot from above. Socialism's record isn't hard to parse. First it was tragedy, now it's a farce. Let's unite people from every nation in peace, exchange, and cooperation. Wow. Yeah. Uh huh. So. I told you Marx was right. <laughs> no way. It's Mises all the way. The free market brings the goods. Yeah, it brings the goods all right. A heaping pile of inequality and strife. Try peace and prosperity. Yeah, I am. I am trying that. You are? Yeah. Okay, because it doesn't look like it. Did you Marx listen to any the first people? thing about peace and prosperity? He only knows about control and power and... Did you watch this? Yeah. Half of it was good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jorge Galicia. You're supposed to do a video, right? It's hard for people to believe that a country with so much potential could collapse so completely. Breaking news in our world lead, Venezuela may be on the brink of no return right now. This is what it's come to in Venezuela. Emergency surgery by flashlight. A massive shortage of food and aid in the country is leaving thousands of Venezuelans literally fighting for their lives. Venezuela was once one of the richest countries in the world. Venezuela's government today ordered schools and businesses closed. Tomorrow as a nationwide power failure continues. Food and gasoline in Venezuela are running out. People say that what happened in Venezuela could never happen here in America. But I was there. I am an eyewitness. And I want to tell you, think again. Hundreds of Venezuelans are fleeing the country. I was forced to leave my life, my family, and my country behind. Now, I want to tell the story. In the year 2017, I was texting with one of my best friends after arriving from a peaceful demonstration against the Maduro regime. Suddenly he said to me, hey man, 
there is a group of police officers standing right in my front door. What should I do now? I, I read this text message and I said to him, well, do not open the door, go hiding and remain quiet. But after this, I never received a single text message back, just a terrifying silence. My name is Jorge Galicia. I am a 24 years old Venezuelan political activist and also I am an asylum seeker here in the US. And I'm about to show you a couple of videos of my homeland. One from the year 1970s and the other one from, the, from nowadays. <laughs> Caracas, the swinging city of Venezuela. Good climate, fine buildings, wide highways with plenty on them. All in all, a pretty nice place to be for many reasons. We have some breaking news in our worldly Venezuela may be on the brink of no return right now. Violence and bloodshed erupting in the streets as both sides accuse the other of attempting a coup. Self-proclaimed Venezuelan president Juan Guaido is calling for Venezuelan citizens and members of the military to join him in taking control of the country from socialist dictator Nicolas Maduro, who stands accused of holding a sham election and illegally ignoring the National Assembly. I want to warn our viewers, we're about to show some graphic video of the violence that's taking place in the streets of Venezuela today. You can see members of the military who backed Maduro literally mowing down protesters in the street today. As CNN was broadcasting those images, the network was taken off the air by the dictatorial Venezuelan government, and at this point has not been put back on in that country this afternoon. So how did we get from the very first video that you just saw in this screen where Venezuela is basically being shown as a nice place to live in and as a nice place to be young, to the second video where you saw all of these political, viol political violence and people, young people like me, being hit by a military truck in the middle of the road. How does that happen? Well, today I'm going to try to give an answer to that question, but first of all, I'd like to share a little bit of my own personal experience of how it is to live under the Venezuelan dictatorship. I grew up uh, in a middle class family. We were never rich, but I definitely believe that in the past we used to have a really good life and a happy one. For example, my family and I used to go uh, to restaurants like the one you're seeing in the screen. Uh, when I was a child, I used to have the latest versions of my favorite video games, great birthday parties every year. It was a good life. But now, and thanks to the collapse of the system, that situation has changed almost completely. To the point where, in my house, we don't even have constant water supply anymore. So me and my mom need, needed to drive to certain places in Caracas fill up some big water containers, bring those back home in order to do the regular activities that need to be done at home. Electricity is constantly failing, and every time electricity fails, internet connection fails as well, which means that I cannot communicate with anybody in Venezuela because my communication relies completely on internet. And even food is really hard to come by. Uh, all, all, almost Less than two years ago, one of my main uh, desires in life was to be able to taste again a piece of pizza or hamburger, because all of those things became uh, luxury to me. And let me give you this picture so you can understand the reality. Let's say if one of the guys here want to, let's say that you visit Venezuela, let's say tomorrow, and you want to, some of the guys want to take on a, de on a date a Venezuelan lady, well, it would be enough to take her on a date to a McDonald's to cause a good impression. That's how miserable we are right now. But do not believe that this whole situation with me and my family is somehow isolated. Actually, if you compare my family situation with the rest of the Venezuelan population, you would still believe that we are somehow still privileged among society. Because, for example, my grandma, she suffered for, for, from high, high blood pressure problems. And she needs to take a medication on a daily basis in order to control her condition. And despite all of the difficulties that we're seeing right now in Venezuela, we have been able to provide the pills for her. But this is not the reality for majority of Venezuelan people. We're seeing how thousands of, of Venezuelans are dying on a daily basis because they cannot find 
the medicines that they need to survive. Diabetic people die because they cannot find the insulin that they need. It is horrible. And let's, uh, let's not even talk about uh, worse diseases like cancer, for example, because this is how Venezuelan hospitals look nowadays. And by the way, this is, this is before COVID-19. So you could have an idea of the effects that the pandemic is having in, in my nation right now. It's horrible. But this is like one or two examples that I could show to you of so many today to demonstrate how horrible the situation is in my land. If you read the news about my country, you will see headline after headline how horrible the situation is. And because all of this uh, uh, nightmare, we have already seen how more than four million people have already left the country. And uh, actually we're about, I don't know, maybe we already did, uh, we're about to surpass the Syrian migratory crisis as the biggest one going on right now in the, in the world, right? And it, it, it talks really bad about our system because in Syria you have an actual war, war going on. In Venezuela we don't. And we go to places like Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and uh, sadly, majority of, of Venezuelan people don't have enough money to afford an air ticket and not even a bus ticket. So they go by walking to reach their destinations. And sadly, many of them have died because they cannot face uh, the horrible weather conditions, but well, they rather take the, these, these chances than staying at Maduro's Venezuela. And another comment about COVID, well, all of these people that have left, many of them are now returning because they lost their jobs in their, in their, in, in their, in their new countries, and they are being evicted from their houses, and they said, well, if we're going to starve anyway, we, we'd rather starve in our homeland besides our grandmas and parents. Really sad situation. But anyway, uh, for me, the dangers didn't stop there. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was a political activist. In the year 2014, I joined the student movement of my university. That's me. <laughs> and uh, I also joined uh, a small political party named Vente Venezuela, which is uh, basically a political party standing for uh, economic freedom, religious, uh, religious liberty, freedom of speech, basically every single value that makes it possible to live in a free and prosperous society. But in Venezuela, in order to do this, this kind of things, you need to be a risk taker and a big one. Because the political police is always out there trying to locate opposition leaders, opposition leaders that are trying to do something against the regime. And I'm not talking about violent people. I'm talking I'm not about the military leaders trying to do some sort of up uprising. No, I'm talking about YouTubers, people on Twitter and Instagram, songwriters, bloggers, peaceful people are just, are just trying to advocate for whatever they believe in. For example, this lady right here, the right there, her name is uh, Ines Gonzalez Arraga, and she was sent to prison because she wrote out a couple of tweets against the dictatorship, and of course they didn't like what she wrote, and that was enough for them to, take, to send her to a dungeon. This guy right here, his name is Joshua Holt, uh, he's an American citizen. He was doing a missionary trip in Venezuela to help the poor, and because of that, he was accused uh, of being an American spy in Venezuelan soil, and he was taken to prison. And actually, he, he was uh, recently with Donald Trump at the, at the convention. It was really great to see him there after all of this suffering. And uh, not even judges are free of the repressive hand of the regime. That lady right there, her name is uh, Maria Lourdes Afuni, and she was sent to prison because she wrote down a sentence against the dictatorship and they didn't like what she wrote, of course, and they accused her of being a traitor or something like that and they throw her in, a, in, a, in jail. And this is exactly what happened to me and my friend, the one I was talking to you about at the beginning of the conversation. He and I were so deeply involved in the massive demonstrations going on against Maduro that, well, sadly, my friend was targeted by Maduro's political police. And Basically, they broke in into his house in the middle of the night without a warrant, without any sort of legality or due process, and he was taken. Basically, he was kidnapped. And um, at the moment I realized that this was happening, I was terrified because I knew for a fact that, it, that the next in line in order to be captured was me because he and I were doing exactly the same things at exactly the same location and time. And actually, at the moment he was captured, well, both of us were texting through our phones. So the police was actually able to read everything we were saying at the moment. It, it was really terrifying. And uh, thanks to that, I was sent uh, into a 
religious place because I needed to be totally isolated from the rest of the world. I, needed, I was sent into this place, uh, and I cannot reveal to you like the name of the place, the location of the place, and not even the religion that they follow in this place because I don't want to take any chance of compromises with the, compromising the safety of these people. But uh, I was sent there, and I needed to shut down all of my social media accounts, turn off my cell phone completely. I was not able to communicate with anybody outside this, outside this place, not even my mom, nor my dad, anybody, total isolation. And this was a completely life-changing experience in my life because, well, one day I wasn't a student, I was attending my classes, worrying about, I don't know, my next day exam, re reading the lectures that the professors were sending, and all of a sudden I saw myself involved in all of these hiding and persecution situations as if, as if I were, was, were some sort of criminal, and of course, I was not. And uh, during my time in this place, I was uh, extremely stressed, first of all, because of my friend, because despite the fact that I was not having the best time in my life, I mean, I was isolated outside of my home, I knew for a fact that he was taking the worst of the situation because he was in prison, actually, and, and he was being beaten in a daily basis, he was forced to eat food in really bad shape, he, w he shared uh, cell room with the worst of the Venezuelan population, meaning rapists, murderers, and all, all kind of criminals. And while he was in this place, well, I was not able to provide any kind of help for him or his family to, to try to get him out of that, of that place. And uh, actually, I was feeling really some kind of guilty because I thought, well, if, he, if he's there, I sh probably I should be there you know, sh sharing the, the, the consequences. I don't know. I, I, I feel like his situation was somehow my fault. I don't know. And, um, and uh, also I was uh, extremely worried about myself because, well, I didn't know for how long I was going to be in that place. I was constantly a asking questions like, will I ever be able to see my mom again, to resume my ordinary life? Will I be, a will I be able to finish my law degree? Will I need to escape? through the border, hiding under a truck. Those were the, 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 the thoughts that were invading my head every single night. It was really horrible. And then, uh, thanks God, well, my friend was uh, released from prison, and uh, that situation also allowed me to resume, little by little, my ordinary life in Venezuela. But I, I never got to be the same, to be honest. I, I was constantly, I was living with the constant fear of expecting the police to show up in the middle of the night just the way it happened to him three months earlier. And well, because of that, I decided to stay away from the political activism in Venezuela because, uh, well, not because I stopped believing in what I believe right now, but because I didn't want to take, to compromise the safety of especially my family, especially my mom. You know, my mom is like extremely overprotective. She, she calls me every second. It's, it's, something, it's crazy, it's crazy. And, <laughs> And uh, imagine, imagine for someone like her to not be able to, to know what I was doing, how well I was if I was eating for almost three months. She didn't know where I was, if I was taken, if I was alive even. She, 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 I, she almost lost her mind. And uh, I didn't want her to go through the same again. But well, because of that decision, I was able to finish my law degree in Venezuela in 2018. And after that, I applied to participate in a great uh, leadership program named uh, Project Arizona. Oh. Uh, I hate this machine, you know. <laughs> anyway, I was elected to do to be part of that of that program, and that's basically the reason I've got to be. Uh, I can be here today, and uh, I was supposed to go to go back to Venezuela on May first last year. But while I was doing this program at ASU, Arizona State University, well, this was also happening in Venezuela. The appearance of uh, Juan Guaidó and his insurgency of, as the legitimate president uh, of my country. And because of this situation, well, I started to receive a lot of invitations from the local media in Arizona, st uh, student groups at ASU, people who wanted to know more about the insights that what about the situation that was going on in Venezuela because we were like on the top of the news during those days. And well, basically, I resumed my activism while I was already here in the US. And uh, of course, that situation forced me to stay here and claim asylum because I know for a fact that 
the dictatorship is paying attention attention to the things I'm doing here, and uh, if I if I go back, they will probably they certainly will throw me into into some dungeon, and I don't want to go to prison right now. <laughs> but anyway, how how did we get into this point in Venezuela? How did it all start? Did it all begin in 1999 when we first uh, elected Hugo Chavez as our president? Or maybe we actually have to look even further into the past to understand the, the causes, the actual causes that led us into all of this political and economic uh, catastrophe. Because while I was doing this program at ASU, I used to talk a lot with progressives in the room. I, and I used to say to them things like, hey, I know, I know all of you have like, the best intentions for this country and you want the best, but I, I'm convinced that your political ideas, if they are ever applied, are going to lead, to lead the U.S. To, to, the same, to the very same environment that led Venezuela into all of this political and economic catastrophe. And when I, tell, when I told this to them, they used to reply by saying, no, that, you know, you don't really, you're not really that well informed. Uh, the progressive movement here uh, in America is not advocating for the very same policies followed by Hugo Chavez and by Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela. And uh, when I first uh, heard, he heard this argument, I stopped for a second and I thought to myself, well, you know what? These people actually may have a point because if we're going to be honest about these topics, we have to admit things like, well, Hugo Chavez came from the military, that he uh, incarcerated um, like hundreds of political leaders, opposition leaders that were trying to uh, oppose his regime, that he uh, created a paramilitary group named uh, Colectivos, which is basically a group of civilians carrying long weapons and, weapons and terrorizing society all, all over the, the country to avoid any kind of political opposition, that uh, he confiscated thousands of private properties and, pri and private businesses. So in that sense, I do believe that the progressive movement may not be necessarily the same to Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro here, um, in, in, there in Venezuela. Well, at least not, not all of it, because right now we're seeing a lot of radical expressions like Antifa and stuff like that, right? That's, I think those guys are much more similar to Hugo Chavez and Maduro, but I don't think they represent them as a whole, hopefully. Um, but anyway, but let me ask you once again, how did we get, how did we reach this point in Venezuela? How, what did we have even before Hugo Chavez and Nicolás Maduro? Did we have a... a a government with a balanced budget and, a, and an open economy, or, or maybe we had something much more similar to the kind of welfare state that progressives are advocating for here in America. And in order to answer that question, let's focus this talk for a while in the decade of the 70s. Until this decade, Venezuela was used to grow economically every single year. We used to have the greatest uh, GDP in the entire Latin American region. We used to have greater GDP than countries like in Spain, like China, like Israel, like Greece. Venezuela economically was doing really well. But then, in the year 1975, under the presidency of this guy, whose name is Carlos Andres Perez, two things happened that completely reshaped our history until today. The first of those things was the nationalization of our oil industry. I don't know how many of you know, but Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the entire world, and by the time, we used to be one of the main oil producers of the world. And the second thing that happened was that we saw a, a massive boom among the oil prices in the global market. So the combination of these two factors allowed the government to spend much more because they were receiving a lot of new resources. And, well, his administration decided that they wanted to use these this new resources to tackle the problem of poverty and to create more uh, equality in the Venezuelan, into the Venezuelan society. So the way they tried to, tried to pursue this, or, this objective was through the creation of uh, new subsidies, new social programs, everything that you could possibly imagine. And I'm going to show to you right now some, some examples of the things they did during this, this time in, in our history. One of the things, free college for everybody. The government created this uh, social program designed to grant scholarships to any Venezuelan who wanted to pursue 
studies at the university level. The only requirement? to receive an admission letter from any major university, even around the world. And because of that, well, we saw thousands of Venezuelans going to study to the very best universities of the world, meaning Harvard, Oxford, or where, where, any, any, any other you could possibly think of, basically for free. None of them was required to pay back to the state a single penny. And it didn't even, even matter, matter whether they graduated or not. Free healthcare for everybody. They, the government created more than 20 public hospitals where any Venezuelan, regardless of, of, of their condition, could attend. You could be poor, you could be rich, and you, all you needed to do was walk into these places and there you would receive uh, free medical health care and, and, uh, and attention for free. And even the gasoline was being subsidized by the time. Venezuela has always been famous for, ha for having the cheapest gasoline rates in the entire world, but this was never because of free market and competition, but because of this huge government subsidy. But what happened next? Well, in the year 1978, this huge boom that we saw with the oil prices came to an end. And because of that, three things happened that, as I told you, reshaped our history until today. The first of those things, massive levels of inflation for the first time. Uh, why? Well, because the politicians by, the, by this time were so committed to the idea of not making any single cut to the, to, the, to the levels of spending in Venezuela, and actually even beyond that, many of them were elected under the promise of expand all of the social programs and subsidies that, we, that were already in place. And the only way to do this without uh, the big oil revenue was through raising taxes, borrowing money, and printing mo new money out of nowhere. So this created in the, by, by, for the very first time in our modern history, massive levels of inflation, and it is really sad because the Bolivar, our national currency, used to be one of the strongest uh, currencies among the, among the entire world. But this came to an end in the 80s. And what inflation means, for example, is that if I go to a restaurant to get a, a hamburger, today, let's say, it would cost me four Bolivares, but if I go to the same place a week later, it would cost me probably, I don't know, eight bolivares. And while this is happening, your salary is basically remaining in the very same position. So Venezuelan society was becoming poorer and poorer with the pass of the time. And the, the drama of this is this is not happening only with burgers, it's happening with housing, it's happening with medicine, it's happening with almost every good and service of, of, the, of the economy. The second thing that happened was that we saw the creation of a culture of dependency. In the year 1999, Venezuelans re-elected Carlos Andres Perez for a second uh, presidential term because many of, of, our society, of, of our people thought, well, if he, if he was the mastermind behind all of these great social programs and subsidies and if they were working just well under his command and if the economy was also working really well, well, maybe if we put him back in power, he will realize a way to uh, you know, get the economy back in order, right? And uh, they re-elected him, and, but surprisingly enough, he came with new ideas to, to power. He and his team realized that the levels of spending in Venezuela were no longer sustainable. So he, so he decided to pursue some great reforms that were pointing in the right direction. He tried to eliminate many of the subsidies that he created in his first term. He tried to roll back many of the uh, social programs that he created during, during his first uh, administration. But what happened? Uh, it was already too late. Venezuelans were, were already used to the, the idea of living out of government assistance. And many of, of, the, of, of my people were, uh, didn't know how to live a, a productive life without the, uh, the assistance of government. So the very first day after he announced the reform, this happened, the Caracaso Revolt. Uh, thousands of Venezuelans went out to the streets to loot private businesses, to riot against the government to burn infrastructure. Sounds kind of familiar, right? And, uh, and, and well, this resulted into one of the most uh, violent episodes in our modern history because sadly, well, uh, the, the, the government to take, to resume the, the, or, the law and order in the, in, the, in, the, in the nation, they sent the army and well, hundreds of Venezuelans lost their life because of the clashes between the population and, and the army. So uh, I, I've, I've noticed people, pushing Trump to send the army to, to stop the, the riots, maybe that's not a, the best idea. 
So, and uh, the third thing that happened was the appearance of Hugo Chavez himself. Uh, in the year 1992, he tried to overtake the government by the use of force. He failed, but, uh, well, his, his attempt gave him a lot of popularity among society because he was basically rooting for the very same ideas that were popular among society during these days. He was telling people things like, hey, Venezuela has uh, these massive amounts of oil, meaning that we, you are entitled to receive all of these social programs and subsidies and everything you want. And if you are seeing cuts from uh, the administration, it is because of the corruption of the political elite and because of the greedy of the capitalistic sector. And well, he became really popular. And then later, uh, he received a pardon from another administration which allowed him to compete in the 1998 uh, election. He won and, well, then as a president, he managed to, um, to create this paramilitary group that, that I told you about, Colectivos. He managed to confiscate all of these uh, private businesses in Venezuela. He, uh, he changed uh, the name of the country. He changed the constitution. He changed the flag, I mean, he transformed the Venezuelan society for the, for the worst. And, and now, after more than 20 years, we haven't, been able, we haven't been able to remove the system that he created and that now endures under Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela. So, yes, I would say that uh, the progressive movement here in America is not necessarily the same to Hugo Chavez and Nicolás Maduro, but I believe that if their proposals ever get to be in place, they are going to create the very same environment that led Venezuela into the appearance of negative leaders like Hugo Chavez and then Nicolás Maduro. Uh, it worries to me a lot to see how the levels of spending keep growing here in America. Apparently it doesn't even matter any anymore whether Republicans or Democrats are in charge of the federal government because the, the spending just keeps growing. And this is only until 2015. If, we, if, if I add the, the, the new stimulus bills and stuff, we would probably need to, to give this, uh, this conference in the, in the southern world, world <laughs> to, to, to see the whole graphic, right? But, but I, th I really believe that if the American society doesn't find a way to put a, a break into all of this uh, massive spending, well, you would probably see yourself in the future in a really bad economic situation. And will you end up like Venezuela? Maybe, maybe not. But you could end up like Greece, like Argentina. I mean, history is full of examples of, of societies that collapsed because they were not able to, co to control their levels of, of spending on time. And uh, well, if I were you, I would definitely uh, avoid voting for politicians that offer me free housing, housing, free college tuition, or free whatever, because, well, as you, as you just saw, in Venezuela we had all of this, even before Hugo Chavez, and, but it, it was never free. It costed us billions of dollars and ultimately our own freedom and democracy. Before uh, I finish, I'd like to share with you the story behind this little bla bracelet that you see right here. This was made by my friend during his prison time, and it is all made of plastic bag. Uh, and we were, when, we were, when we were able to meet again, uh, he gave it to me, and it is like the most uh, symbolic gift I have ever received in my life because it works as a reminder of my purpose, purpose in life, which is no other than to keep fighting for justice and for liberty wherever I am, because this was the product of an injustice, and I just cannot stand waking up every morning seeing this and not taking any action to improve the place where I'm living. So thank you so much. Thank you to the Steamboat Institute for inviting me here and letting me share my personal story. And of course, thank you. Thanks to the Fund for American Studies for making it possible also. So God bless you and thank you. Jorge, we have a, we have a few questions that have been submitted by the audience. Um, if there were a free and fair election right now, do you think the Venezuelan people would vote again for socialism, even if not necessarily for Maduro? Well, that's a good question. I, I tend to be optimistic in that matter. I think uh, right now, because the, the, 
you know, the force of the situation has made us as a society realize that we were following a wrong system in the first place. And for, let me give you an example. In the past, every time the government announced uh, a, a, a rise in, of the minimum wage, for example, society used to, you know, they celebrated or they say, this is not enough. We need more minimum wage. And, you know, I was always like, no, that's not what you did right now. And now, even the poorest section of the society knows that when Maduro announced a, a raise of the minimum wage, that means that, well, they're going to lose their job or they're going to see their prices of, of whatever is left in Venezuela to buy going up. So th small, small aspects like that, uh, I think Venezuela ha Venezuelans have already learned the lesson that, the lesson that uh, socialism is not uh, a good idea. And actually, uh, s many of the opposition parties in Venezuela used to, to label themselves, themselves as socialist uh, opposition parties. And, uh, you know, when Hugo Chavez was alive, the fight, you know, the debate in Venezuela was, well, Hugo Chavez is right now in power, but if you elect me, I'm going to give you even more free stuff of the things that <laughs> he's given to you. Because he had, when he was in power, well, he, had an, he also had the luck of receiving a lot of all the revenue, so he had a lot of money to share. So, so um, the, the debate was really complicated. But now, all of these political parties that used to label themselves as socialist are not doing it, doing it anymore. Many of them, for example, were affiliated to the International Socialist, and they are taking that, taking that affiliation out because they know that it is not popular anymore to claim them to say that we are socialist. Um, what will it take for the removal of Maduro? Surely the people and even the military realize that he must go for the country to survive. Yeah, I, I sadly, I think everybody realized that for by now, but I think the problem right now, right now in Venezuela, is that the, you know, the regime Maduro is receiving a lot of help from the Cuban regime, from the Iranian regime, from the Russians, from the Chinese. They don't want him to leave power because they know that Venezuela can work as a as a safe territory to do a lot of bad businesses and 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 bad, you know, criminal activity to, and possibly to af affect even U.S. interest because Venezuela is really close from from the United States. So. Because of him receiving a lot of, uh, of help from these foreign regimes, the fight is really uneven. And uh, we actually have seen a lot of attempts from the, within the military to try to uh, replace Maduro, but sadly they have, they have failed because uh, the military is fu fully infiltrated by Cuban the spies, Russian spies, and it is really hard for, for us to work uh, from a, for a solution from within Venezuela. Um, since you're familiar with the U.S. asylum process, tell us your thoughts on our asylum process and what changes do you think should be made to that process? Well, my own experience is uh, it was a little bit of a little chaotic. You know, in May, uh, uh, I mean, like a week before I took the decision, I was supposed to go back to Venezuela and then I decided to stay and I claim asylum. But then I, you know, I, my plan to, to be here was to only for three months and then go back, right? But all of a sudden I saw myself in a situation where I was not able to work because I didn't have like the legality to do so, but I, but I, also, I also was not able to go, to go back. And, uh, and you know, I claim asylum in May and until this date we haven't been able, I haven't received any, not even the chance of explaining my case into the, in front of the migratory of officials, right? So I think the process is extremely slow for some people. And for example, my, my dad, who also suffered some, some political persecution, uh, he came here in 2016 and he claimed asylum. And oh, today, 2020, he hasn't, he, he's in the same stage as I am. So it is, it is, it is really chaotic and, and I don't understand why. It is, it is really, unf I think reform is needed, definitely. I, and you know, that period of time when, right now I have a, a temporary work permit because the rule says that once you claim asylum, if you don't receive uh, a chance to expose your case in the first five months, then you would receive a temporary work permit. That's my situation right now. But these, those f five m months uh, before that were extremely challenging for me. I was living out of a, you know, charity. It was horrible. I didn't like that. But yeah, the reform is needed. <laughs> What's happened to Juan Guaido? Nothing. <laughs> 
he, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think he's gonna be a solution for our people. When he appeared, he was like extremely popular among Venezuelans, but now basically nobody listens to him anymore because of the lack of results. And uh, the sad part of this is that there are a lot of suspicion, if, that's, if that's a good word, I don't know, that many people within the opposition uh, actually have economic connections with the dictatorship in Venezuela. So they might, they might be claiming that they are fighting against Maduro, but when you ex start seeing reality, you realize that, well, these people are not pushing as hard as they should push him for the removal of the regime. So I don't know if Guaido is part of that, but, but certainly a lot of people within the, his circle is, so that's a problem. I, I don't know. Have you been able to go back and visit your family at all? Have I been back? No. Uh, you, you can't. I can't. You can't. I'd love to. Once, w ex even, you know, w once Maduro is gone, I'd love to go back to Venezuela and try to rebuild my nation. That's my, that's my dream. And one more question. Um, this, this could be a long answer, depending, but what do you see are the steps that should be taken for Venezuela to recover from, from this failed socialist experiment? Well, the first and most obvious step is getting rid of the dictatorship. And that's not going to be easy at all. We have tried almost anything. We have been through elections, they, and they cheat. We have been through negotiation tables, and they don't abide by their word. We have tried to peacefully demonstrate massively, and they start uh, killing students uh, in the middle of the street like you just saw. So sadly, I think that we are not going to see any, any solution to get rid of Maduro without you know, some sort of military action even within Venezuela, from outside, I don't know, but that's a sad reality. I, I, that's a sad conclusion I have reached so far. And after that, well, of course, the reconstruction process is going to be really tough. We need to rebuild almost anything. The judiciary system, the, the economy, I mean, nothing in Venezuela is working right now. So the, I cannot even start to, 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 you know, to make a list of the things that we need to be done because everything needs to be rebuilt. It's gonna be a really long process. Just a couple more questions. Um, has your family faced any retribution for your speaking out uh, so forcefully and so publicly in the U.S.? Have they, has that created any problems for them back in Venezuela? To my family, you mean? Uh, not so far. Uh, that could happen, but you know, when, 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 you have, when the regime starts to attack uh, families of, of leaders that are uh, abroad, it is only because they are doing like extreme harm to them, like they are lobbying for more U.S. sanctions, for example. That's a way for them to, if you do that, they are going to start attacking your family. But at this level of speaking at college campuses, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Hopefully, I'm praying for it to not be. Um, what type of response have you had from students? You've spoken on, I don't know how many college campuses you can tell us, but what response have you had from students who perhaps thought they supported socialism, but after they hear you speak, ha do you feel you've been able to change any minds? Well, I've, I have spoken so already more than 15 colleges so far. It has been a really great experience. Uh, of course, I cannot read minds, but uh, I have met a lot of people that at the beginning of the talk, they, they come here with, and they listen to me with, uh, like, you know, they are trying to, like with this aggressive act attitude, and you know they are not uh, like really happy to be there in the first place. But uh, for example, once a lady, uh, a girl that uh, uh, heard me, she approached to me and she said, "Listen, I, at the beginning I didn't even want to come here. Uh, my friend basically forced me to come here, and uh, but I, I was really impressed by your by your own experience. So thank you for coming. And I don't know if if he if, if he was a socialist and she's not anymore." Or, Maybe she wasn't, or maybe she still is, I don't know. But I think people are, are willing to hear. I, I have had great welcomings in my, in my experience. If, last question, if, if there's any um, advice or direction you can give to this audience on what, what would you like to see as, as an outcome of your talk here today, what, what do you hope people will do after hearing your story? Well, I think, my advice to people that want to change uh, 
you know, the mindset of the, of, of the youth is we as, as conservative should start like providing solutions to the problem that these people are claiming to have because I think, I think they, 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 there are actually real, pro real problems and, and for example, let's say uh, college education, I think, I, th I think there's a real problem there. They, I mean, it, is, it, it, is, it, is, it seems to be really expensive. I mean, I cannot afford it. And, um, and, but I think these students should realize that this, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the cost level of, 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 of college is, is, is high, not because of free market and, and competition, but because of government interfer interference in, in, this, in, this, in, in this market, right? Because the, go the federal govern government keeps loaning uh, uh, you know, money to people so they can study whatever they want. And, when you start uh, explaining like the real problem, what's what's causing the problem, and you offer solutions, well, you might be able to to to, to lead the fight, and, and and because the thing is right now, where, what I'm seeing is uh, you know among conservatives especially that they tend to you know just ignore the, the the claims of these people, saying they say, well, America is the best country in the world, probably it is, but it doesn't mean that we don't have problems, right? And uh, and then you you start hearing. Bernie Sanders and AOC and all these people throwing out uh, solutions that are not going to solve anything, but rather uh, uh, making the situation even worse. And they, well, they they buy these ideas because that's probably the only thing that they're, he they're hearing, right? So that's my advice. Jorge, thank you so much for speaking to our event. I know our audience enjoyed you. Let's have a big round of applause for Jorge Galicia.